bunch of books and bookish things have come into my life over the last month, as I'm sure they have for a lot of you, and I want to share them with you because I think there are a lot of good things in here. I'm Sarah, and I love books from independent publishers and university presses, and I come here on YouTube to talk about them. I don't anticipate doing a ton of book hauls on this channel because I don't want to give myself the excuse or the encouragement to consume and acquire books at a massive, massive rate. The word haul itself really plays tricks on my mind, like urgent scrambling, kind of like a, like a pinata at a kid's party where like all of the kids rush in and are just scrambling to get as much candy as they can into their haul. So I tried to come up with some synonyms for the word haul to make myself feel better about it, but it didn't really work because, well, let me just read the list. <laughs> synonyms for haul spoils, loot, booty, yield, payload, plunder, score. <laughs> the best I found was maybe like harvest, like book harvest or, or find, like book find. Book finds, that sounds nice. Or maybe we could go with haul like in verb form, like, um, like schlep. <laughs> like as in I schlepped all of these books home from the bookstore or I schlepped all of these books to the living room so I could film this video. Anyway, I've talked myself into doing this because I want to talk about books and bookish things and the whole point of this channel is to get great books into the hands of great readers. I do have a mixture of mostly independent um, press published books but then also a few from larger publishers too which is great because big publishers publish amazing great books too. I'm going to group these by timing and location of their acquisition. Book acquisitions. So the first group of books is from a trip I made before the holidays to my local bookstore called Women and Children First, which is a wonderful feminist bookstore in Chicago. My husband, my son, and I went there to do some Christmas shopping for each other and I did some sneaky purchases for each of them but if I've learned anything from my mother it's that the best part of shopping for gifts for others is buying things for yourself as well. <laughs> so for my very own self I purchased The Consequences which is short stories by Manuel Munoz. This is published by Grey Wolf. Um, this is brand new. It was published in 2022. And the first line from a story called Susto. No one in town even knew the old man's name, but they pretended they did after he was found dead by the foreman one day at the end of winter. So they, all these stories are set mostly in the small towns that surround Fresno, California. It says the messy and sometimes violent realities navigated by the Mexican and Mexican-American farm workers and their families who populate these stories. Straight and gay, immigrant and American born, young and old, are tempered by moments of surprising tender care. And it's got one of those like almost gel-like covers, They're almost like juicy. And Sandra Cisneros says, Manuel Munoz is a great American writer who sees with his heart. I wish I had written these stories. And then I also picked up on that trip an autographed copy of Get Em Young, Treat Em Tough, Tell Em Nothing by Robin McLean. I had been eyeing this one and that previous one um, for a few months. This also just came out this year. And this is published by And Other Stories, a story called Pterodactyl. And the first line is, the plan was to meet Larry at baggage claim. And then the title story, get him young, treat him tough, tell him nothing. The night guard was getting sloppy again. And the back says, dark, profane, and hilarious, yet ultimately humane. These 10 stories are the latest and best of Robin McLean's reports from the eternal battlefront that is the United States. And it's just got a really cool title. So I'd already picked up those two books to purchase for myself on that visit. And I was scanning the shelves and you're like, look and look and look. And I was looking for um, logos of indie presses that I recognize. I saw it. <laughs> it is so petite. This is from Archipelago Books and um, it's there. All of their books are um, kind of like styled in this same, same format with the kind of texture on the cover and the similar font and an image in the middle. I had heard some wonderful things about this book and so I immediately picked it up. So this is Kabogo by Scholastique Mokasanga and it's translated from the French by Marc Polizzati. And again, this is Archipelago Books. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read the blurb here because it's really beautiful. Um, so this is, this takes place in Rwanda. And it says, Kabogo's story is reserved for the evening's end, when women circle a fire drinking honeyed brew. One storyteller weaves the old legends of the hillsides, stories that church missionaries have done everything in their power to expunge. Kabogo's tale is at once an origin myth, a celestial marvel, and a source of hope. 
And for the white priests who spritz holy water on shriveled trees, it's considered forbidden, satanic, a witch doctor's hoax. Everyone energetically debates Kabogo's story, but deep down secretly wonders, can Kabogo really summon the rain? When a rogue priest is defrocked for fusing the Christian gospels with the martyrdom of Kabogo, a fierce clash of creeds ensues. With gleaming flashes of acerbic humor, Mukasanga brings to life the vital mythologies that imbue the Rwandan spirit. In doing so, she gives us a tale of disarming simplicity and profound human truth. And Zadie Smith um, blurbs this, saying it's an essential and powerful read, and so I can't wait to get to it. So then a few days later, I was in Evanston, Illinois, which is a town lovely town north of Chicago. I mean, I was there for a meeting and I had parked in downtown Evanston and on my way back to my car, I had to pass by uh, a lovely bookstore in Evanston that I love to visit called Book Ends and Beginnings. And I went in for the few minutes of free time I had. I, of course, bought some books. And so what Book Ends and uh, Beginnings had on their shelves, because I, you know, I was scanning really quickly, um, were mostly some um, some books published by really well-known independent publishers. You'll definitely recognize these, these books. So first up, I picked up Dr. No by Percival Everett, and this is published by Grey Wolf. And this is uh, Everett's newest novel. Lots of people have been talking about his most recent novel, The Trees, which was also published by Grey Wolf in the United States. And this is his next novel. Um, and I talked about it pre in a previous video. Um, actually, I've talked about most of these in previous videos. This sounds just crazy in the best way. <laughs> the protagonist's name is Wala Kitu. Wala means nothing in Tagalog and Kitu is Swahili for nothing. <laughs> he is an expert on nothing. That is to say he is an expert and his area of study is nothing. This makes him the perfect partner for the aspiring villain John Sill who wants to break into Fort Knox to steal, well, not gold bars, but a shoebox containing nothing. Once he controls nothing, he'll proceed with a dastardly plan to turn a Massachusetts town into nothing. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And then I also, because I've always wanted to read it and saw it and was, I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but I picked up Duck's Newberry Port by Lucy Ellman. This is um, published by Biblioasis and it was published in 2019. Uh, oh yeah, it's shortlisted for the um, Booker Prize in 2019. So famously, famously long, I think it had like a reputation for being one paragraph, but it's not one paragraph. Um, there are there are paragraphs. Anyway, but this is about a housewife in Ohio and um, she contemplates her four kids, husband, cats, and chickens. And as well as America's past and her own regrets. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows if I'll get to this this year? I don't know why I would have bought it if I didn't want to get to it this year. That's the problem with book hauls. <laughs> So then I purchased myself a copy of Braiding Sweetgrass because I got this from the library and loved it and I wanted to have my own copy of it. Here it is. And also I am working on my kind of milkweed wrap up. I've been uh, reading many, many books from milkweed um, ever since September. And so I'm gathering my thoughts on all those books that I've read and I um, can't wait to share them with you. So that's coming. Please look forward to that soon. And then I was at the checkout counter at Bookends and Beginnings and I spotted this. This I had seen online when I was doing some research into Biblioasis and which is publisher, Canadian publisher. They have these um, short stories that they publish that are, they call them their Christmas ghost stories. And so each little book is an illustrated short story, like from a classic, famous, well-known author. I had seen those and I thought, oh, that's such a fun idea. Um, because I guess it used to be tradition to um, read a ghost story on Christmas. Um, and in the evening, you would all gather around and someone would read a ghost story and we've kind of lost that tradition. And so they've been publishing these little ghost stories that are um, illustrated by the artist Seth. So this was sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, and I picked it up and the guy was like, oh yeah, we used to have some um, from Shirley Jackson, but those sold out right away, of course. Um, so this one's called The Dead and the Countess and it's by Gertrude Atherton. 
and it's a wonderful little story. I did read it on Christmas, and it's about this um, priest who he tends this uh, graveyard outside his church, and a railway is built right next to the graveyard, and he's so worried about the dead in the graveyard that they're going to wake up, and they're going to think that, you know, the judgment day has come or whatever, <laughs> that, um, yeah, he kind of freaks out about that. And then a duchess, um, I'm sorry, not a duchess, a countess dies and, or is on her deathbed, and she says she wants to be buried in this old cemetery, and he's all worried because he knows she won't get any real rest if she actually is buried in that cemetery. So it's very like charming and, and a great little ghost story. Um, I wanted to read it out loud to my family, but I realized as I was going to bed on Christmas um, that I hadn't, and so I just read it myself and it was wonderful. So I do order a lot of books from Pals online and um, I think they had a sale, which is maybe why I made an order after buying all these other books. I don't actually remember. I picked up um, three books that I had been wanting. First is Reading Like a Writer by Francine Prose, um, a guide for people who love books and for those who want to write them. And I've always wanted to read this book, so I picked it up. The next is uh, Please Be Advised by Christine Sneed. And Christine was um, my very first creative writing uh, professor in college. I'm kind of a mega fan and I have a bunch of her previously published books but this is her newest novel. It's called Please Be Advised and it's a novel in memos. It is published by 713 Books so I mean you can see it's literally memos which is super fun and it says uh, cubicle culture has never been targeted more hilariously than in Sneed's exuberant totally told through memos tale about the rise and fall of quest industries so it's about you know the drama within one particular company and it sounds hilarious and amazing and she's a wonderful writer so i'm excited to read this and then i picked up the classic fairy tales by maria tatar tatar i don't know how to start her last name the classic fairy tales by maria tatar and this is published by Norton, and um, I do this kind of creepy, stocky thing where I go onto like universities' websites and I kind of scan through um, their syllabi that they, some of them, post online um, or like course descriptions because some universities do post their <laughs> course descriptions that you can go and. Um, as a member of the public see um, and some will list their reading lists for the class and so I don't remember what the class was I don't remember what the university was but I know that I saw this book listed and I thought that sounds cool so I got it it fo it's basically focuses on six different tale types Little Red Riding Hood Beauty and the Beast Snow White Cinderella Bluebeard and Hansel and Gretel and includes multicultural variants of these tales along with sophisticated literary rescriptings. Each tale type is preceded by an introduction and annotations are provided throughout. So criticism, literary criticism of classic fairy tales. And then my little kiddo got me some bookish gifts as well. He was so excited to pick out um, these beautiful pencils, which are so cool. I don't know if you can see them. They're called Creativity is Power Pencils, designed by Lisa Condon. And then to go with them, some beautiful erasers. So these are perfect for all my note-taking needs. They're called Make Mistakes Erasers. So they each say, they say, own your story, make mistakes, begin anyhow, and creativity is power. Look at this. That is so satisfying. Okay, we're almost done, um, and I want to ask you to hit the like button or subscribe or other YouTube nonsense, but I'm afraid that the more likes I get, the more encouragement I'll get to haul more books, but do what you want. So then after Christmas, I had another trip to Women and Children First. I was in a state. I was very sad because we had to cancel a trip to visit family in Ohio and um, I won't go into why <laughs> here but I was really bummed and I had just gotten off the phone with my dad and and had like canceled our trip and um, yeah I was in a state <laughs> my husband was like just go to the bookstore <laughs> so so I put on my mask and went out and went to the bookstore and it made me feel a little bit better then I bought some books so I did my thing where I like scan the shelves and I'm looking for indie presses and I found some winners. So first is Night of the Living Res 
um, stories by Morgan Talty, and these this is published by Tin House, and I know I've seen a lot of people talk about this and really enjoy this. Um, so this is set in a Native American community in Maine, um, and it I actually listened to a great interview with the author, um, and I believe it alternates um, between well, it's the same character, like a, a young a young date. I think David is it David. Um, it's all in first person, so I can't like see <laughs> for sure. So it's narrated by David. So it's as a young person, David, and then older goes by D. So I think that's a really cool setup for a short story collection. Oh, I love that. So the first sentence of Earth Speak is, Felis drove with his knee and lit a cigarette. Okay, so in a story called In a Field of Stray Caterpillars, the first sentence is, all the staff, the psych techs, the nurses, the doctors kept asking if I was searching for an exit. That's a great first sentence. So then I was scanning the tables, looking around the bookstore, and I saw Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Owl. And I had heard about this book, but I didn't realize it was published by New Directions in the United States. I had seen it published by Fitzcarraldo editions in the UK. I had seen some YouTubers talking about it. I was like, oh my gosh, I was pl I'm planning on doing a, a New Directions, you know, focus for the first part of 2023. I've subsequently seen other people like um, American booktubers have this edition um, since, since that time. This is a story of a mother and a daughter who are um, on a trip to Tokyo together. One of those really quiet, maybe no plot, <laughs> plotless, short little novels that pack quite a punch when it comes to exploring relationships, especially between two people who should know each other pretty well, mother and daughter, um, but you know, kind of missing, keep missing that those opportunities for deeper connection and don't seem to be able to really communicate with one another. Um, and it just follows them around their trip in Tokyo to restaurants and galleries, and then has lots of flashbacks to the narrator's um, life. Very beautiful so far. Um, and then I spotted, I, the, I mean, the cover called to me first, it's called Nocturne. It's a novel by Jeb Loy Nichols. And this, I had never heard of this. Um, it's from Pushcart Press. And I think it's another, it sounds like another very quiet novel. Um, it says, drifting through the waterways of England on their canal boat home, a long married couple are surrounded by past lives, memories, and unfinished business. It's a journey not of discovery or recovery, but of temporariness. Floating between what they've left and what they hope to find, they find new meanings in the small, often overlooked grains of life. That just sounded really intriguing to me, so I picked it up. And finally, my kiddo and I were talking the other day and he um, was eating a snack and he was having those little seaweed. This is such a winding way to get <laughs> to this book. But he was having those seaweed snacks and he was like, well, how do they make these? And so I went, <laughs> of course, to YouTube and was like, how do they make the seaweed snacks? So we watched a little video about how they make the little flat salted roasted seaweed snacks and it was really interesting. Of course, as YouTube does, it then recommended another video that looked interesting that was about ketchup and the origins of ketchup. I was like, hey, do you wanna watch, you know, this three minute video about like the history of ketchup? He was like, yeah. So we watched this this little video about the history of ketchup and learned that it originated in Asia and it was more, it was used to be like a soy sauce, a soy based sauce, soy sauce based sauce. <laughs> Eventually colonialism and <laughs> soy sauce, you know, the idea of this sauce was brought back to England, but there wasn't any soy, there was no soy sauce. And so they were using all sorts of ingredients to try to uh, make this kind of a, a sauce and this idea of this, this ketchup sauce. I am not explaining this well because I haven't read the book yet. What I'm trying to say is that ketchup didn't used to be made of tomatoes. It was made of originally soy and then all sorts of other things like mushrooms and blackberries and then eventually tomatoes. Heinz came along and, and made the tomato ketchup that we know today famous and made it ketchup. Wow. What am I trying to say? Oh, so the expert that was being interviewed in this little YouTube video had written a book. And my son saw that and he's like, I want that book. <laughs> you know, it's like an academic kind of book about ketchup, whatever. He's very spoiled. So I went online and I bought it. It's called Pure Ketchup. 
and it's a history of Americans, America's national condiment with recipes, and it's by Andrew F. Smith, and this was published by the University of South Carolina Press. And it is literally a history of ketchup um, with recipes. Introducing ketchup and its polyglot parentage, um, the rise and demise of homemade ketchup, it just goes, you know, all these periods of history of ketchup, and then it has the recipes. They include anchovy ketchup, apple ketchup, cockle ketchup, cucumber ketchup, grape ketchup, herring ketchup, ketchup for mutton, kidney bean ketchup, lemon ketchup, liver ketchup, lobster ketchup, mushroom ketchup, mussel ketchup, oyster ketchup, peach ketchup, raspberry ketchup, pimento ketchup, squash ketchup, sugar ketchup, tomato ketchup. Pretty fun, but excited. I have, I kind of have a thing for these like single ingredients, like single subject cookbooks. I mean, this is, a, this is more than a cookbook, obviously, but I have like a gingerbread cookbook and I'm blanking out, a pierogi cookbook. <laughs> so like the very focused one thing cookbook. So this fits right in at our house. I hope you enjoyed that book haul, but don't get used to it. Have a great day. I hope you find something good to read and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.